So we're gonna we're gonna be over here. Hi, I'm Richard, and this is Lava's 30th Sunday Salon, and I want to thank everyone for coming. We have two speakers today. Our first speaker is Pepper. Pepper Arnold. Pepper, this is on the screen is a photograph of the Follies Theater at 4th and Main, and Pepper grew up there. And yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Christina Rice is going to be our second speaker, and she's going to talk about Anne Dvorak, one of my favorite screen starlets. And before we get started with any of this, let me just make some initial comments and statements about upcoming events. Uh, my birthday bus is, is in six days. Eight hour trip to Antelope Valley, two museums, and a Joshua Tree Preserve. It's in the flyers. Every, does everyone have a, everyone get a lot of the flyer? I threw them out on the desk tables, grab them. Hi, Mr. Roy, it's good to see you. Uh, after this salon, we're having a walking tour. It's a home door walking tour of 3rd and Broadway, the Bradbury and Angel's Flight. And Suzanne Lummis is going to be leading it. And with any hope at all, our good friend Donald Spivak, who is former Deputy Director of Policy for the Community Redevelopment Agency of Los Angeles, will be joining us to talk about the Bradbury Building and Grand Central Market and Ira Yellen and a long list of people who've saved the Bradbury Building over the decades and everything that's happened there. It's a really interesting neighborhood. And of course, Poem Noir is going to be a series of poems by three poets, Suzanne Lomas being one of them, about film noir and film noir locations, which the Bradbury Building and Angel's Flight certainly are. And lastly, December 12th, Dorothy Parker Society of Los Angeles is hosting a free cocktail party at the Los Angeles Athletic Club uh, in honor of a new Dorothy Parker cocktail book, which the Dorothy Parker Society of New York is publishing. It's in your booklet. Just register. Just go. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then, last but not, I'll introduce the next salon at the end of the salon. So, um, Pepper, are you ready? I am. Okay, good. All right. So Pepper is going to get up and, and talk, and she's going to talk about her grandmother, Lillian Hunt, and this. Oops. There we go. There we go. Uh, you're going to talk about your grandmother, Lillian Hunt, and this theater, the Follies, and the new Follies, and I'm, I'm going to stop talking and let you take it away. Thank you so much, Richard. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So, there will be some reading from notes because I have a tendency to digress. I have a tendency to get off track, and I want to stay on the track. I don't want to fall off. Anyway, I'm really excited to be here. I want you to talk in there. In. Okay. I was four, four years old when I went to my first burlesque show. And it looked a lot like this, but not, not the opening number. I didn't really know what I was going to see at four years old. I just know that I had on a really fancy little dress and a, I remember a little coat and a hat and I was holding a little purse. So not me now. Anyway, <laughs> that's how I was dressed. And I was told that grandma and grandpa would be there and I had two other grandma, I mean another grandma and grandpa. On the other side of town, a little Russian Jewish grandma and grandpa, and my father and his six brothers, but this was my mother's father and mother. And they were my grandma and grandpa, and I'd just only known them a little while because they had come back from uh, back east from the burlesque circus. Well, circuit is what I found out, but I didn't know that at four. At any rate, we go into the theater, and it was, I thought I was in a palace. It was absolutely if you've ever been into the old movie theaters, or even now if you go to the Pantages in Hollywood, you see how ornate and beautiful they are with these little cherubs and gothic and I don't know what all you call them. That's how the Follies was on the inside. Um, outside, not so much. It was a box office and we'll have some, I have a picture of that. Um, but I thought I was in like a fairy tale. And when the curtain went up, and the music started to play, and I remember that one of the songs that they used most was, there's no business like show business. Some of you may remember that song. And I remember standing up in front of my seat and holding onto the seat in front of me 
who I know I must have like had like big wide eyes because when the curtain went up, there came my brand new grandpa to me uh, with a bunch of dancing girls behind him, tap dancing. I don't know if you remember tap dancing, but that's what they were doing. Hoovers, they called them then. And there was grandpa in a white tuxedo jacket, and he was singing, there's no business like show business. And in the middle of that, he said, now you're going to find out what my real name is. Hope you like the show, Pearl. Oh my God, I heard my name. Don't call me that. I'm here. <laughs> anyway. Pepper, your grandpa's behind you on the screen. Oh, all right. There's grandpa. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Um, there's my grandpa. That's not my grandma. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nah. -uh. Uh, well, as long as I'm telling you, that's Venus, the body. And I'll, we'll talk about her as we get into this. But yes, that's grandpa. He was a straight man. Leon DeVoe. And... From the minute that I saw that opening, I was in love with show business, I gotta tell you. And it, it was the be all, end all. And little did I know that for the next 12 years, my childcare was gonna be backstage at the Bollies, or in the pit, or running around in the lobby trying to find the candy guy so I could get some candy. Um, that was the way it was gonna be. Now, after the chorus girls, my grandpa singing, there was kind of a drum roll kind of a thing, and the stage got dark, and in the middle of the stage, I saw a leg come out between the curtains, a bare leg, and it was a lady named Roma. Actually, we should talk about this first. These gals here are parading around what was known as the runway. There's the orchestra pit. There's lots of curtains you see on the side there in the wings. There were rows and rows of curtains. So they go all the way back to the far back of the stage, depending on what they wanted to use, where they wanted to set the, the stage sets and so forth. And this probably was the finale, because at the end, all the girls, the chorus girls, the strippers, would come out and they would parade around the, um, the runway. And the orchestra in the pit and there were four, four musicians. There was the gentleman who played the, uh, he played the saxophone and the clarinet, the guy who played the trumpet. There was Gordon, the piano player, who was absolutely my best friend in the world. And Jesse, the drummer. Now, if you know anything about burlesque, you know that the drummer is very important. <laughs> You get what I mean? I'll show you. Not right now. I'll, I'll save that for last. But anyway, Jesse sat a, a little bit above so that he could see all the moves of the strippers so that they, the walk was right, the bounce was right, the bump was right, the grind, the whole thing. It's very important. So from time to time, I did get to sit down there next to Gordon, the piano player, and so I learned the names of a lot of different songs that I heard in the day, um, because I see the sheet music, and so that was, that was a big thing for me to be able to sit in the pit. But I also like to stand in the wings. So anyway, that's, that's, how, that's how the theater looked. But for me, this day, my first day, chorus girls were gone, grandpa's off stage, and I see this leg, we're back to the leg. And her name was Roma, beautiful lady. And she came out, I thought she was gonna dance. And she did, and she danced around the runway, beautiful long red hair. She danced around. And then, she started taking off these long gloves. Really slow. And off with the gloves. Well, pretty soon, not too long, maybe two songs later, she was down to some pretty skimpy little knit underwear and a little bra, a little kind of like bikini thing with some strategically placed rhinestones. Get my drift. And I was too young, too young to know whether this was good, bad, right, or wrong. 
I just know that it was wonderful. It was just wonderful. And then off she went. She couldn't take off anything more. And then Grandpa came on. He was a straight man, which means he kind of delivers the line to the comic so the comic can do the punchline. And the way they have it set up, they, they call these, uh, you would probably think it well as a skit, but they call them the scenes. It's, it's Seinfeld. Seinfeld's the Duffus. Oh, okay. Yeah, Seinfeld, the oh, Duffus, straight oh, man. Yeah. Oh, okay, good, thank you. Um, but they had different kinds of backdrops depending on what the, the theme of that particular scene was. So they had one that came down, I mean, this thing had a, a I guess like a wooden, probably a two by four, so it dropped and hit the stage, and you see this big um, street scene, and they come out and they do their shit. They had all kinds of props. They had a, a, some of the scenes that, that, that they did, you've seen actually on I Love Lucy, some of the old, old uh, I Love Lucy shows were taken right from burlesque. Cleaned up a little bit, but not that much because the burlesque scenes were naughty and there was innuendo. They weren't vulgar, they weren't dirty. They were just kind of naughty. Anywho, was Grandpa. One of the scenes that I used to love was, um, they called it Hold the Car. And what it was is these two, the, the comic and the straight man, were um, trying to pick up girls in their car. And the car was this wooden, you know, cut out of a car that they had to hold you know, out on the stage. And girls would come by and they'd try to pick up girls. And it had a, it did have a little door that would open. And so if they did get a girl in the car, she'd step over and step into the car. And if she didn't respond the way they wanted, they'd say, get out of the car. <laughs> and so she'd step out and go on. So there'd be several girls like that. But in between each one, when they go out to talk to the girl, one would say to the other guy, hold the car. So that was why they called that skit, hold the car, because it had to hold the car. So that was, that was the show, the first show that I saw. And I had no idea that I would be coming back um, every evening, every weekend, every birthday, Christmas. Now, they, um, the shows, how many shows they have, they have Three shows a day from Monday through Thursday, with a new show on Friday every single week. And this is where we get into my grandmother, Lillian Hunt. Because I knew Grandpa was on stage, but once I got to go backstage and see all the wonderful things back there, there was my grandmother. And what did she do? She was the producer, director, choreographer, just about everything. She kept the show going. Seven days a week, um, like I said, three shows a day, Monday through Thursday, and then midnight shows on Friday and Saturday, and the mat an extra matinee on Sunday. So, and every week, a full rehearsal, and a brand new show, new costumes, new scenes, everything. That was what she did. And she loved it, and I loved watching her. Um, it was just, it was like, I couldn't imagine being any other little girl. And it never occurred to me that, that there weren't other little girls somewhere that weren't at the Follies. Now the Follies Theater, the old Follies, the one where I saw this first show, um, was a pretty amazing theater. It was built. Here's, there's a picture. There we go. Tell us where it was again. It was, it's on, it's in the 300 block 4th and Main. And across the street I remember was the Hippodrome Theater. And they used to, uh, somehow they knew my grandfather and we'd run over there anytime they had a good western and let us in and watch the western in between shows. And over here was the Goodfellows Grotto, which was an amazing old restaurant. We didn't eat there that often. And the waiters, it was all really older men, all dressed in white. And I just know I used to have Welch rabbit there all the time, although I thought it was Welch rabbit. And I couldn't really understand where the rabbit was. But, um, and so you can see there, uh, the front of the Follies, in fact, both theaters, the, what was the Burbank then? The front was, it was not 
gorgeous. That's why it was so amazing when you walked in and you actually got into the main theater that seated, um, and well at one time they seated about 1,200 and then it was down to about 900. I, I, I'm not sure why they you know, repositioned seats and so forth. Um, there you see, this was the old ones, two young men trying to decide <laughs> if there was a way for them to go in and see whatever was going on. And uh, you can just like to hear that conversation. And in fact, what's really cool is the picture. This one? That's actually Roma, the one that the first lady that I ever saw do a script. So how excited was I when I found this on the internet? And next to her, that the other picture is uh, was a lady named Evelyn West, who was, I guess you could say she was a precursor to Tempest Storm in the bosom department. <laughs> um, and so there, lots of boys were trying to figure out, well, so that's what's going on in there. And let's see, what else you got there? Uh, we've got the, the, the front of the side of the door bay. Okay, well we don't want to go there yet. Why don't we... Go back to get Phyllis Grotta. Okay, let me go, yeah. I want to hear about the inside of Goodfellas Grotto. Oh, the Goodfellas Grotto? Please. Well, okay. Wait, 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 wait. For everyone, Goodfellas Grotto is right here. This is Goodfellas Grotto. This and Goodfellas Grotto is now a parking lot oh. next door to the Barclay Hotel uh, at 4th and Main. Yeah, the Barclay is, would be where the painting is. Well, I believe it was, I know that clam chowder was a big thing there, so it must have been a seafood restaurant. Remember, I was pretty little when I started going there. We didn't go there maybe once a week or once every couple of weeks. But the inside, as I recall, was all white and separate rooms. We ate in a little, like a little room with a table in it, and that's where, I guess that's all it was, was these private little rooms. There may have been something else, but that's where we always sat. And like I said, the um, the waiters were all dressed in white. Everything was white in there. The towel over their, you know, over their arm. And it was really a neat place. And I know that I always had the Welch River and the and Gramps. They usually had the clam chowder. On the other side, which you can't see here, was um, I guess it was a bar. It was called the Village. And there was a side door from the theater that would take you through this little walkway right into the village. And <laughs> so handy for, I would say that comics really like to go over there. And, uh, but I got to go occasionally because they also had some of the best hamburgers in there. In fact, I have a hamburger with Lily Saints here. We'll talk about it briefly. And I just thought she was the most beautiful person in the world, and she's eating this messy hamburger like, you know, like it's nothing. And I'm sitting there with food falling out of my mouth, and just looking at her like, oh my goodness. Oh, oh there, there we she go. is. There's Lily in her bubble bath. Now, it really, really wasn't really a bubble bath. It, there was a bubble machine. <laughs> uh, Lauren told her, turn on the bubble machine. Um, and then it was all glass in the front, so when she got in, you could see what she was doing. Now, Lily St. Cyr was not a stripper, you know, like, come out and she's just shaking everything. This was a very um, upscale routine. In fact, she had several different routines, and the, 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 the set was always a chaise lounge, a bed, a dressing table, uh, a screen where she would go behind it and she would change clothes, and, and the music was always Rhapsody in Blue. That was her, her song, her signature music. Uh, and, and, it, and it was quite a, a thing for the little four guys in the orchestra to have to practice that. <laughs> have to practice that thank before, you. thank you, um, before the routine, before the routine. So, that was Lily in her bubble bath, and it was very ladylike, but somebody saw that and said that it was obscene and there was a court trial. And she actually had to go to court and do her bubble bath. They were, they were always trying to close the old follies. 
There was always a city council or something. The vice would come back there. Now you wonder, well, did they do anything about the fact that there was a little girl there? No, that didn't happen. Occasionally, Grandma would say, get in the dressing room. Because I used to stand in the wings, and the strippers sometimes, they didn't all pay me, but some of them would give me a quarter for catching their wardrobe, so that when they took their clothes off, they would fall on the ground. So, um, so no, I didn't get in trouble doing that. I did get in trouble when I auditioned for a little, um, it was like a talent show, I think it was in the third or the fourth grade. And the only thing I knew was, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just bad. Sunshine. <laughs> I actually, it took a while for the teachers who were choosing who was going to be in the talent show to figure out what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would have thought the way I was walking across the stage to Basin Street Blues that they'd have some idea. No. It was only when I got down to my lip was a little undershirt that had a little, like a little, a little bow here, and all of a sudden I just remember the principal and teachers that were sitting there jumping up together and going, you know, stop. <laughs> They all visited my grandparents and my mother at home and they heard the story. Nowadays, I think probably I would have been removed and put in foster care, don't you think? <laughs> Thank you for clothes on. Believe me, that was the last time that anything was happening. So, the other thing that I did, which when I think back at this now, it's embarrassing. Backstage at the Old Follies, um, when you walk in, like on the side of the stage. Behind the stage was a long, skinny dressing room. And in that dressing room were the chorus girls. Now, chorus girls only lasted, I would say, from 44 to for a couple of years, just finances. There was a lot of girls tap dancing, and that was not the direction of where the business was going. It's kind of like the legitimate theater and the legitimate aspects of it, the special dancers, those kinds of things were starting to go away. But anyway, there was a space off to the side where when the music would play, I started learning how to dance. And I would dance, I can't believe that I did that. I kept my clothes on. But I mean, the strip music would come on and if it was one that I really liked, I'd go over there and I'd dance and some of the comics would come over and watch me. I can't imagine what was I thinking and I was so proud, you know, that I was able to do that. In between, in between the, the shows, they showed regular movies, small screen, but, you know, it wasn't some cinema, cinemascope, cinerama type thing. And uh, mostly uh, Charlie Chan movies, which I learned to just absolutely love. And then they have all these little um, short films with Leon Errol and the, the Three Stooges back when Shemp was, you know, they were hitting Shemp in the head. Um, so I would go down in the orchestra pit. And the musicians were happy to let me go and sit there in between the shows and watch the movies. Sometimes I'd watch from the side, but usually I wanted to go down the pit with my, my baby Ruth and my Nekos. Does anybody remember Nekos? Yes, really good. Now they did feed me occasionally. My grandpa and grandpa, between shows, there were other places in downtown Los Angeles that I absolutely loved. And I honestly, I don't know if they're still here or not. I know there is a pig and whistle in Hollywood. The pig and Whistle's gone. It, it was, is gone? It was uh, half a block south of here. Okay. On Broadway, yeah. Pig and Whistle was one of my favorites, and the reason I liked it was, well, amongst many, I liked the little sandwiches that I got to order. But kids got this mask. Uh, it was actually the children's menu, but it was a pig mask. And you put the mask on, you sat there with this piggy mask on. <laughs> so when we were going to the Pig and Whistle, I was one happy little girl and I ordered off of the little piggy mask uh, menu. So I'm sorry to hear that it's gone, and I don't know if the one in Hollywood has that, but no. it was really cool. Um, 
We ate at Clifton's cafeteria occasionally. There was another cafeteria. That's, that's gone. Yeah, and we did go there. We did. did. When we I did. first we met you, through. that's where we, 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 that was wonderful. And there was another cafeteria at the Forum. There was Cape Coffee Dance. This was the Forum. This was the Forum. This was the Forum? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. There was only one thing though about the Forum that I, I gotta tell you. This was big back when I was a little girl. Do any of you remember when you have to have liver and onions yeah. at least yeah. once a week? Yeah. Well, the Forum had liver and onions, and I had to have that. Down the stairs here in this very building, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, Coffee Dan's, anybody remember Coffee Dan's? Oh, yeah. oh, wonderful coffee shop. I didn't have coffee there, the waffle. Grandma had her coffee, my grandma. And I gotta tell you, since this is supposed to be about Lily and Hunt, let me just tell you, when grandma took me to these places, my grandmother always dressed in Lily Dash Asian suits, pillbox hats with just the tiniest little veil gloves. And that was the way she believed ladies should dress. So when my grandmother decided that she was going to have girls learn how to strip properly, <laughs> then it also had to be a lifestyle, that you were a lady. My grandmother's philosophy about stripping was, you don't have to be vulgar, you don't have to have vulgar um, gestures or facial expressions. I used to hear her say, keep your tongue in your mouth. <laughs> um, gosh, I haven't thought about that one in a long time. But I think at the time I didn't know what the heck she was talking about. But anyway. So, um, it was very important to her for them to learn how to dance properly, to move properly, costumes, but also off stage. And because she was so good at this, she actually started an agency. And I have to tell you, this was an agency for strippers that I should be looking up here. This is Patty Wagon. I like to say she was my big sister because we actually did kind of look alike and because we looked alike a little bit, she used to copy me and I used to copy her. <laughs> we were just, there was something about our personalities. Very sweet girl. Her name originally was uh, Patty the Cohen with the educated torso. My <laughs> that was good, that was good. But um, Patty wanted a different name because she's like, you know, I don't live my college anymore and I'm over that. So they came up with, it was either gonna be, uh, Grandma was gonna name her either Patty Cake or Patty Wagon. And Patty Wagon is what they came up with. This was a really great gal, dear friend of mine. She married a, a baseball player who was tragically killed, uh, I think it was 1968, so they weren't together all that long, but really a swell girl. But once again, she was very, she was exuberant and flashy in, in, in the way she uh, expressed herself. She was a lady. These girls that my grandmother had in her agency that she started, the Windsor Hunt Agency, um, were taught all manner of, of Things. So one day, and I happened to be there, and we see Tempest. There she is. This is Tempest Storm. And I can tell you that when she walked in to talk to my grandmother the very first time, she looked nothing like that. And she'd be the first one to tell you that. The, the beautiful face was there. The other attributes were there. <laughs> But she was heavy. She had frizzy, frizzy, frizzy black hair. Um, and she wasn't dressed very nicely. She talked to my grandmother for a long time. And when she walked out, they hugged. And that was the beginning of a wonderful relationship. My grandmother um, helped her with her costumes, um, helped her lose weight. They came up with the name Tempest Storm. I don't remember 
I think they thought about thunderstorm, but they came up with tempest storm. And um, the hair became red, beautiful hair. This is a beautiful girl. She's absolutely the sweetest lady you would ever hope to meet. And always dressed, is that expression to the nines, is that still used? That's how she dressed. Uh, and, and I understand she's still stripping today, and I would love to see her because she was one of the sweetest, nicest ladies on the shy side. I tell you, she was very soft-spoken, very shy. Wow. I, well, I, I advanced her slide for you. Oh, okay. That's Lily again, Lily Saint. So that's probably one of her more bare <laughs> photos. Um, but you can. You really, you can tell, okay, she looks beautiful in the picture, but in person, you have no idea how incredible she was from head to toe. The most beautiful woman I think I've ever seen in person. Um, very sweet lady, and she had um, a large dressing room, and she'd have a maid with her, and Follies, that actually helped her in her dressing room. Um, some famous uh, people came to see her at the Follies. Burt Lancaster ran into Burt Lancaster in the lobby of the old Follies. Uh, and that, I'm going to guess that was somewhere around 47 or 48, because I was just starting to recognize movie stars, especially when I was told, okay, that's a movie star. Um, let's see. Somewhere around, and I had to go online and look at this because it's really weird because I can't even remember what I had for breakfast today, but I can remember stuff back then. It's incredible. I don't know if any of you find that, but some of your memories are just so sharp. Um, there was a day at the old Follies when my grandma and grandpa told me, Follies is closing. And I was devastated. I had had birthdays and Christmas, and and people were wonderful. There's there really are no people like show people, and I was devastated that the Follies was going to close. And of course, everybody was going to be out of a job, and there was a big concern about that. Um, and then all of a sudden, the news got better, and I'm guessing it was 1951 or 52. Probably 51, um, when the news came that we were going to move, we, see, I was part of the show. The Follies was going to move down to the Burbank. We got a picture of the Burbank. There we go. Tell us, tell us where this is. This is on 6th and Main. It's gone now. It's gone. It's gone. Um, this theater um, was built, I think, it might have been the early 20s. You know, I, I didn't know much about the theaters themselves when I was a little girl, but just recently... It was built in the teens. It was built in the teens. Okay. They, um, they had a lot of major actors and actresses that appeared on these stages. People that went on to become very famous in legitimate plays and, and shows that were, that, that were there. But once again, if you look at the outside, it's not very attractive. Um, and somewhere, oh yeah, I remember Dreamland Dancing, oh yeah, you could go up there, it's like 10 cents a 10. So tell me, you're, you're, you're talking about this blade right here? Yeah. Yeah. This was a taxi dance hall. Yeah. That was a, that was a big deal. You could, sometimes you could hear music coming from there. Um, the, I don't even want to read that marquee <laughs> to you. So you're on your own. If you can't read it, it's, you don't need to. Um, but there was, on facing the theater on the right side, there was a shoe shine, a guy that had like uh, shoes. And then there was a big double door, and it said stage door, you know, and you could go in. Long, long, long hall that would take you back to uh, what they called the green room. This is where people could smoke, and um, then beyond the green room was backstage. Now, 
the first time I went there, I just I just felt like the new kid in school. I mean, it was it was weird because the layout was totally different, but still had the runway. The theater was not as ornate. It was more Art Deco. With how we do? Ten minutes. Okay. So there we are at the New Follies, and at first my grandmother said, "Okay, Mr. Welch, who's the partner." It's not going to want a little girl hanging around. And I was devastated. Well, that lasted maybe a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden I was back. And when I came back, they had actually found a little room for me that was like a little dressing room. And um, I could do my homework there because I was getting older. And school was, I was required to get good grades and to be, have extracurricular activities. But the Follies was a big part of my life. And the new Follies, uh, yeah. There's the Patty Wagon. But she was still the co-ed with the educated torso. <laughs> I love it when they say all-star cast. Uh, my grandfather, meanwhile, through all of this, was still a straight man. Uh, grandma and Grandpa did, uh, they, they uh, made a lot of burlesque movies. I actually wish I owned some of these. Get them on Netflix. I, on Netflix? Yeah. Oh. Well, I know that there's a, a some kind of distri distribution company that has, uh, I think it's called Something Weird. And some of the movies are Peekaboo, that was made in 1953, B-Girl Rhapsody, Too Hot to Handle, Kiss Me Baby. And the thing that comes back to me, Kiss Me Baby, is that my grandfather, who was also liked to sing, I mean, he had, a, he had an okay voice, he, but he could sell it, you know. Uh, and I just remember that movie, when, when I did see it, he, they started it out, he was singing Kiss Me Baby. Um, Mickey Rooney used to come to the theater. Um, Jill Wills, Joe Ewell, Mickey Rooney's father. Jack Albertson, um, because they knew my grandfather back in Vaudeville days. Now, let's talk about the school for strippers. Did we show that one yet? I'm going to finish up with that. I don't... Pepper, I think I, I forgot it. I'm oh, sorry. no. I'm sorry. That's okay. I thought I had it. That's okay. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it on there. Well, first of all, it, all it was really was a picture of my grandmother. It ran in magazines and newspapers. It was a picture of my grandmother with three, three of the girls that were in her agency that were standing at a ballet bar with their leg up in the air, which, you know, that's the way they were standing. It's like, I don't know why she was doing that, just to show that they were limber, I guess. But um, it's like, okay, well, it was called a school for strippers. She would never have called it a school for strippers. But she did teach. And whether you realize it or not, it's very important to walk like a stripper. It was like the first thing you needed to learn. So how does a stripper walk? And I didn't even have to take my clothes off. You would have said, put them back on, put them back on. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. When did it finally close it? Okay. Um, well, let's let's do both theaters. So, let's start with the Follies. Okay. Um, Seventy-four. They demolished. They tore it down. They tore it down in seventy-four and made it a, a building, I guess. No, I, it's a parking lot. It, it was a parking lot. I somebody had told me they turned it into a building. The sand. The edge of it um, is a building. Yeah. The the corner of the Ronald Reagan State. Yes. Building. Yes. Um, up above on the second floor uh, was where all the costumes were kept, that my grandmother, because she made new costumes every week for the chorus girls and, and so forth, and even when we went to the New Follies, we used to go back there, upstairs to the dressing, to the, and, and she'd get uh, costumes and so forth. What happened was really sad at the, at the New Follies. Um, business was really good during the Korean War, uh, but things were, I think cultures, culture was starting to change a little bit, you were starting to see art theaters, which was really more X-rated films, um, there were new dancers, just things that were happening. So the chorus girls went away, 
um, the, uh, the musicians went away, they used taped in music. My grandfather, who all his life had been an actor and a straight man and a singer, uh, was a stagehand, just keeping the theater. He was the only stagehand there. My grandmother, unfortunately, in 1961, developed uh, cancer. And she still conducted business with her agency, took good care of her girls, made sure that they had great jobs at different theaters and nightclubs around the country. And then she passed away in 1964. I, I don't know when they, the, uh, the Burbank went away from the old. Oh. Sir? Uh, I was going to go to another question. Oh, oh no, that's fine. I, 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 they demolished the Burbank in, in the late 70s, too. They also, also yeah. OK. Um, could you uh, tell us the composition of the audience? Were they servicemen? Were they couples? Absolutely. I remember different time, times of the week, the audience was different. And I know that I didn't particularly like midnight shows on Friday and Saturday when the war was on because the audience was, it was service men. And they were screaming and hollering through the whole thing. And it was just, they were crazy. But on a Sunday matinee, there would be men and women that would come to the theater. And um, I just found out recently that uh, a cousin of mine, first cousin, had no idea that I was raised backstage at the Follies, had taken his wife there. You mentioned the different kinds of audiences. Were there any security problems and how were they handled? The only security that I ever saw was the, um, we called him the candy butcher <laughs> at the, at the, um, at the old Follies. And, Occasionally, what would happen would um, there'd be some man who was sitting down in the front row with a newspaper on his lap. <laughs> okay, and so yes, they would they would remove them, but they called the police. The police used to come in there quite often just to see how things were. Uh, there, there, there was some, uh, there was a shooting. I was not there when that happened. I didn't know anything about it. Um, At the New Follies, that happened in the middle of the night. Yes, yes. That and I, I think that there were a couple of um, like vice raids, but there was, no, there was no need that I could ever see. And I was there, you know, pretty much every weekend for sure and after school that there was any need for security. In fact, I can tell you that downtown Los Angeles, between shows sometimes, or even during the show, my grandma would say, why don't you go to a movie? And I used to walk by myself after we ate dinner and go up, pick one of the movie theaters on Broadway or Hill Street. I mean, I loved the theaters, the Lois State and the RKO and the Paramount and the United Artists and the Orpheum, all those theaters. So it was just a different time. There were people on the street and cops on the beat. You mentioned the musicians briefly. I wondered if you ever remember seeing black musicians. Yes. Um, repeat the repeat question. I'm glad. Oh, okay, you wanted to know, did I remember black musicians? Absolutely. At the Old Follies, the four musicians there were black musicians. And um, Gordon, the piano player, was an older gentleman. I heard later that he died of tuberculosis. Um, but but there's the orchestra pit at the old yeah. Follies, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's the guy with the, it looks like that might be the, uh, the saxophone or clarinet player. It's heavy set guy and then a I didn't know their names, but Gordon and Jesse I knew really well. I just can tell you one thing about talking about the music there. I was telling my husband this the other day. I don't know if you guys remember um, the song Take the A Train. Dun, 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 dun. Well, I sat there in the orchestra pit and I'm looking at the sheet music and I thought the name of the song was Take the A Train. <laughs> you know, like you. Take the a train. I only realized recently that it was take the A train. <laughs> <laughs> a 
all amazing. The bad part of this was, and this broke my heart, when we moved from the old Follies to the new Follies, there was an orchestra there already, same four musicians, but not the same band. It was an all-white band, and I don't know what happened to the other guys we did hear. I did hear about Gordon sometime later, and I was really sad about that. Yes, ma'am. Um, how were the girls paid? What? How were the girls paid? Was it only tips? Oh no. They were they were salaried. Repeat, and, repeat the question. Oh, she wanted to know how the girls were paid. They were salaried. They were paid a weekly salary, uh, as were the the the, uh, the the comics, the straight man, everybody, my grandmother included. Uh, they got a little bit more money if they were what was called a talking woman. A talking woman is someone who, yes, she was a stripper, or a stripper, uh, but she also could take part in one of the scenes. She could participate, and she got a little extra money for that. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, with these scenes, a lot of these scenes were venerable things that were done lots of times. If they had new scenes, were there people writing them? And who, who were these guys? I don't know if they were if there were necessarily new scenes. There was bits and pieces of them where you saw that they appeared in a new setting. And one of them, I know you've all seen, slowly I turn, <laughs> step by step. That appeared in quite a few um, different uh, formats, just included in it. And then you remember seeing uh, scenes where there was a man and woman at the table and, and there was something in one of the drinks and they kept saying, look over there, and then they switched the drinks. Uh, and they would incorporate them into uh, a different setting. But the gags were pretty much the same. And I gotta tell you, there was innuendo, they couldn't say, they could say hell. They could say damn. They would get in trouble if they said hot damn because it sounded too much like saying God. So there, was a, there were a lot of rules, even for the, the strippers. They couldn't touch their bodies. They couldn't use the curtain. Uh, the pole dancing in those days. Um, so there were a lot of rules. I know I digressed on that, but I didn't see any new scenes. I just saw new, new settings, same old gags. And I gotta tell you, um, I have a couple pictures. I had, this would be the last thing I said. Shut up. Um, my grandfather, when he passed away, I got all of his um, theatrical trunks and so forth, but I was in a bad place in my personal life, and I left the house and left everything. I didn't think to put them in storage. I had many of those skits all typed out that were from the original. Uh, but when these guys would get together, and, and, and the comics and the straight men, and they'd say, okay, we're gonna do such and such a scene next week, their rehearsal consisted of that, 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 because they knew the gags. They knew them. They just knew them. I have a question, Pepper. Pepper. Oh, let me ask you a question. So okay. you, you said that your mother, your grandmother would make the costumes. Did she have a bunch of seamstresses, or what, what was the process? My grandmother would, she would get the costumes from um, the second floor over there at the Follies. This is for the chorus girls, when they, and the ones that they called the, 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 they did the parade. They called it the ballet, but it was just a parade. They wore big headdresses. She got these old costumes that she'd go to a place called Maharams and she'd get feathers and sequins and, and uh, all manner of trims and things and just rework the headdresses every single week. It was just her. She had an industrial type um, sewing machine and that's, that's what she used. No, we're gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna wrap this up. Yes. People, you're gonna read this to wrap this up. Come on, bring, bring the microphone. We're going to read this on here. Read aloud. Oh, rules regulating striptease in the city of Los Angeles. 1952. Yes. Stripteases are legal in the city of Los Angeles as long as they are not lewd and lascivious. The guidance provided by the city attorney's office follows. Performers are required to wear panties and G-strings. A performer was not permitted to 
pass her hands over her body in such a manner that the hands touch the body at any point. The bump and grind is permissible in an upright position. <laughs> Under no circumstances is bumping and grinding to occur adjacent to a curtain or any other object. So. That's, that's yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we're gonna. we everyone. Thank Pepper. <laughs> Pepper, you're here. You're not going anywhere. Oh, no, there are lots of questions. Anymore. You're gonna stay for Christine's talk. Oh, okay. Yeah, so let's take a breath. It's just a couple minutes. Uh, it's uh, almost like seven minutes to one. I want to take a fifteen minute break. Christina Rice, where are you? Before we take a break, stand up. Christina, stand by your books. Christina, you're going to come talk after the break. So, Christina, your books are over here, so people want to get a leg up on your talk. Uh, Jeff, stand up. Jeff, stand up. Jeff of Larry Edmonds, stand up. This is, this is Christina's book table. Okay. 15 minutes. Pepper, you're here. Uh, Christina, you're here. We'll see you. We'll see you. Go, get, go grab an espresso. Okay.